All right, let us, let, us, let us continue on this. So we was at Matthew, Matthew chapter 13, review of Matthew 13 and 44, where it says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like to a treasure that is hid in a field. And when a man has found, when a man has found this treasure, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth, and selleth all that he hath, and, and buy the field. We're coming into a time that we're going to find out exactly if this comment that's named Elenine, or I don't know if it was Eileen, Elenine, E. Lenin, is a comment or a star or a planet. Now, E.L., E.L., and let's, let's clear this because we've already touched on this teaching. Stay tuned. Yah willing, we'll have a time and opportunity to put it forward. Let's, let's touch on this Elenine situation. Because who knows if the comet or the star or the planet or the sign or whatever people want to call it, whatever they feel like calling it, if it really comes to pass, as people have said that it's going to come to pass, we might even lose these means of communication more or less. So it, it behooves us every time we have an opportunity, you'll tend to speak to you, brothers and sisters. It is a joy. It's a pleasure. And we hope that in spirit and truth you're able to receive as well. What we're going to talk about right here is what Luke also warned us about in Luke 21 and 25. So get that scripture while we write this right here. This is what the common is named. They call this Elanine, right, Elanine. And they say that it might be a common. Some say it's actually the planet they call Nibiru, right? Others say that it's a star, perhaps the fallen star. Some say it might be associated, of course, with meteors. And there's been a lot of talk, especially among the globalists and the New World Order and some of those other folks and beings um, about some disaster that might come to wipe out humanity or portion. In fact, there's even a star, uh, not a star, what they call it, a satellite. There's a dead satellite. It's been dead for like 20 years, and these guys have been going up and up and up. They couldn't even grab that satellite, bring it down. But this satellite is about to fall sometime, they say, around Friday. So this is Thursday, September 22nd, and Friday would be tomorrow, the 23rd, and it's going to fall right about, you could say, the, the beginning of, of the Shabbat, which is the Shabbat prior to the Feast of Trumpets, the Feast of Trumpets, which is coming up next week, the, the week following, um, September 28th, according to the, the biblical scriptural, um, the al Kidan calculation. Now, when we talk about lunar and solar, the lunar, in that sense, trumps the solar, if you understand, because the almighty Yahweh, he commanded that the, the new moon is the seventh month, and at this time in the seventh month, count this many, that many days. That is the, that is the key timing. Now, in Christ is, is the solar calculation, as we've touched on as well. The two of them comes together, but the first teacher is, in that sense, of the mother. And Proverbs uh, 1 and 8 says, Hear the instruction of thy father, and what? Forsake not the law of thy mother. Galatians chapter 3, it tells us that the law is a schoolmaster until Moshiach come. In other words, until we are mature and we can take on even that Messiahship. When we say Messiahship, we can take on the name Christian. You see, a lot of folks just go to the church, hear a message, and say, I'm saved, I'm a Christian, but there's really more to it than that. And if you study the Bible, the Bible is very clear on that. If you don't want to study the Bible and still claim something, well, they do have this, um, this, this uh, crime, they call it, what, identity theft? You understand? Do you think that with the Almighty, there's not also identity theft as well, if you call yourself a Christian and you're really not a Christian? You know, and you don't want to really know what the standards of being a Christian really is? Of course there is. This is why it says, try every spirit. You understand? Try every spirit. 
to see whether they are of God because there's many false um, prophets going out there in all of the world. So in Luke 21, 25, it says, And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress, distress of nations. That means nations. You know what nations are, right? With perplexity. So there's going to be distress with perplexity. Not just, I mean, because you could say times are always stressful. People always have certain stresses. All right. But it says with perplexity. Not only that there will be stress, but there will be perplexity, confusion, not being, ah, I can't figure this out, you know. And it says the sea and the waves roaring. The sea and the waves roaring. Now, you know the sea and the waves been in the news a whole lot. And so we don't have to regurgitate on that. Now, this Feast of Trumpets is known according to Torah, according to the Orit or the law or, or the foundation of the faith, which you could say the five books of Moses. You know what Christ will say, the law, and he says, you do err because you don't know the, the scriptures, nor the power of God. If I said, I want the power of God to fall on me. Well, what about the knowledge? The knowledge of the scripture. How about that? Christ already told you the conditions. He says, you do err. You are in error. Not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. So one precedes is the prerequisite for the other. This is why Christ would tell the disciples after the um, resurrection in the book of Acts to stay in the upper room and, and to pray, you know what I'm saying, and to fellowship and to pray and to wait and to be patient and to wait for the Holy Spirit to come upon you. In other words, to wait for your elevation. In other words, to wait for your graduate. In other words, wait until you're ready. Plain and simple. See, now we live in a world where we're stillness. You know, it's when's the last time you have had an opportunity just to go into stillness? Not sleep, not fall off in, into, into oblivion, but just to go and just to be still. You understand? To be someplace where it's quiet. Just for a moment. Even if it's the middle of the night, you just wake up and you just, there, there, there's nothing, no noise or whatever. And just sit still. Do you know how much the soul desires that? But <laughs> it's almost like if you don't get it now, it's going to be a while before you get it later because of the particular time that we are in where there shall be signs in the sun, sunspots, solar flares, and in the moon. They've been talking about the moon and whether the flag is still there and there's some other videos out there which says that there is some activities going on on the moon. That's why they haven't gone back to the moon, that there's other beings, one would say. And in the stars, they're finding new stars and new galaxies. So the more stars they seem to find, the more it's like the universe keeps expanding. The universe keeps seem, seeming like the more they're learning about it, it keeps moving away from them. It keeps getting bigger. It could be just an illusion since there's water and there's water. There, it, it could be just an illusion um, because there's real real things that we need to be doing here on earth, you know what I'm saying, and, and each of us responsibility, personal responsibility in ourself before God and man, but instead they want to run off, you know, and, and explore the deepest recesses. But now we got something that's in our solar system, and this is what they call the comet, the comet Eileen. This is within our, this is within our solar system. You know what I'm saying, are you able to get this over here? Are you able to... Are you able to see the full, um, I want to make sure you see the, yeah, the comet, the planet, Nibiru, the star. This is, this is other, other, uh, other names, other names for it or other, other best guesstimates of what it might be or what it could be. Now, what do we know? Well, we know that the testimony of our black Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMoshiach, as it's recorded in the book of Luke, is this, that there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves 
roaring. The sea and the waves roaring. Now, science tells us that the moon and the magnetics and the different effects. In fact, you remember that, that recent, um, what was it, a hurricane, tropical storm that came through to New York? They were talking about, um, they would say that the high tide, the moon and all that was going to happen, the high tide, and this means that it's going to be even that much worse because the, the tide and the effect of the moon is going to have on the tide, and therefore the sea level is going to be that much more risen. So the sea waves, the, the, the sea and the waves roaring, that means that the sea very choppy, choppy, choppy and unstable. This is beyond man's power to do. You understand? Since three quarters of the earth is water. Think about that. That means we're on that other quarter of the earth. Everybody, whether they're in China, whether they're in Africa, you understand, whether they're in, in, in Europe, you understand, whether they're in the Americas, you know, or the Caribbean, wherever they're at. And if I miss it, Australia, whatever like that, all that land put together is just one-fourth, and three-fourths are water. So that means that three-fourths of the earth is being affected by something. What can affect three-fourths of the earth? Well, we know that there's the magnetics, that, that when this comet that they say is coming forward, and already some say this comment was a part of, let's put this up here for you so you can go in the amount of time that we have. You remember on March, March 11, and we're talking about 2011, there was the uh, tsunami, right? Remember, and that was uh, Japan, right? They said the same so co comment, um, E. Lenin, that caused or that came through, around March 11, notice the numbers, March 11, 2011, the same um, tsunami was connected with the same comet. Now, the same comet is going to even come in a, in, in a greater magnetic stress field or alignment. Some, some call this to be an alignment that is about to happen coming up on... Um, the feasts are coinciding, quite interestingly enough, with the Hebrew, um, with the Hebrew feast of, of um, trumpets, or the Yom Teruah, the feast of trumpets, which the modern Jews call Rosh Hashanah. Now, Rosh Hashanah, let's put this up here right here. The right na full name is the Yom Right, the, is the Yom Teru, better spelled like this from the Hebrew, Yom Teruah, you understand? And for short, we'll just call it um, trumpets, right? And this coincides with the, Hebraic, with the Hebraic New Year that is called often Rosh HaShanah. Rosh Hashanah. Now, Rosh Hashanah is not in the is, is not in the Hebrew Bible. Rosh Hashanah is not in the Hebrew. They, you won't find it. Instead, what you'll find is you'll find Yom Teruah. I think it was like in the what, what was it, the sixth century or the sixteenth century? But it was it was much much later. It was with the later day so called um, um, Jews that they basically um, invented their rabbis invented this two day. Rosh Hashanah, but with Rosh Hashanah coming to the forefront, what is often forgotten is the rightful name is the Yom Teruah, the Yom Teruah, which is connected with the seventh Hebrew, the seventh Hebrew month. Now, it's from then between Yom Teruah and the Day of Atonement, we have to count ten days. There are ten days. Now, the, the Hebrews and the Jews will tell you that these are the ten days of awe. You understand? These, these have been known for more than three to five thousand years, if not even longer than then, but at least over three, thousand, three to five thousand years of, um, of, of Ethiopic, Hebraic Judaism, and even of other forms of Judaism, it's known that between the Feast of Trumpets and Yom, uh, Yom, Yom, um, Yom Kippur, 
or Kippurim, some would call it, which is the Day of Atonement, there are ten days. These ten days are known as the ten days of awe. Those who are into Revelation, the book of Revelation, probably know where it says, and ye shall be tried. Ye shall be tried ten days. Now, we're not saying that this is what's going to happen the next couple of days, but we're not, not saying that this might not happen because what's happening is that when we are looking at the Hebraic calendar, we're putting it into proper order, and we're looking at these signs that are happening, and we're putting it all together, coming from a variety of other witnesses, all these things are stacking up. So even we, our group, as, as, as Rastafari or as Ethiopian Hebrews, may disagree with some cracker barrel white Christian somewhere. But when we're looking at the signs, we're seeing the same signs. You know what I'm saying? So we can understand them a little bit better, and maybe they can understand, over, you know, understand us a little bit better. But the same signs are being revealed. You understand? Non-denominational, without any regard to race, creed, color, so forth and so on. Because these are universal signs. So if there's a sign in the sun, that's universal. That means people over here will probably see it and people over there will see it. Different nations, races, religions, or whatever. So this is a sign of the Almighty for his children and for his creatures to recognize. Now, September 28th to September 29th. This is, this is this right here. This is what we wanted to actually announce. September 28th to 29th. Because it's from, it's from actually the, the evening. The evening. The evening. Let's put this up here so you can... Uh, the evening. The evening. You understand? The evening... September 28th to the evening, September, September, um, September 29th. Now, some Christians are saying that, well, at this particular time, we could see Jesus, Yeshua, return for the rapture of his bride, the church. So this is how some of the, the Christian denominations and groups are likely to interpret it. Now, we touched on some of these issues with the rapture, but more has to be said on it. But there's much more to put out, so we're going to continue from there. Let that be as it is. Now, this is the end of a world. This is the end of a particular world system. And we've been clarifying that the end of the world is the end of the Gentile dominion or the Gentile world dominion. Another way to say it would be to say the end of white supremacy. And this is not personally directed to personal white people. Like some white people say, oh, you just don't like, no, 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 no. The system that we live in, you understand, that has been basically ruling more or less for or had dominion for the past 2,000 years, is a Greco-Roman, is a white system, an Anglo-European system. It's, it's very clear. You understand? Which money is universally accepted? Okay. You know what I mean? Whose symbol, whose signs, let's Christ will say, whose inscription is on that? You understand? Whose language on the dollar is Latin? So now that, that brings us to the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire basically is the white supremacists, that, that's what Christ was showing. That's what, the, that's what the whole Bible's about. So when we say our black Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, you see, if white folks knew what they were talking about, they would be into black liberation too, especially if they were real Christians. But be that as it may, this is the end of, of, of a world or of the world system. This is what's known as the Yom Hadin or the Yom Ha'adon, you understand, the day of the Lord, or the day of judgment. Some say this is a, a rapture point. Now, connected with it is the Nibiru, um, the TK, or the Tiche, the Planet X. Some call it Planet X. Some call it the common E. Lenin, or Elenin. You understand, now, Daniel 
9 and 27 is often brought into conjunction with this. So take down Daniel 9 and 27 and check this out. Now, some Christians have been opining on the Palestinian state, uh, the Palestinian state. Um, and what's interesting is that, you know, what's going on between the state of Israel and Palestine. And, and it, it is kind of interesting that on the 22nd, the 22nd, which is today, but on the 21st, Obama went to the, you know, he showed his two faces. You know, he showed that he has the Janus, the Janus profile. He showed the two faces. He basically said, hey, why are you coming to the U.N.? You can't get nothing here. Go, 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 go back. He basically um, hypocritically went against what he said 12 months earlier that a Palestinian, you remember the whole thing about the Palestinian state. So there's other people probably already talking about that ad nauseum and in more detail. So we're, not gonna, we're just pointing that, that these are some very interesting, curious things that in the matrix of things all have a role to play. So we should, we should note that too. Um, the Palestinian state, Obama at the UN, Obama's flip-flop or his... his He's saying, I'm, he, he's telling the Palestinian, you ain't getting nothing. Why you come here? It's not about talking. Not the UN can't give you nothing. But then stop for a moment. Didn't the UN, wasn't the UN the one who voted the state of Israel? So how, how are you going to say the Palestinian? Oh, he's running for 2012. Oh, okay, I get it. You know, basically, but there must be consequences and, you know, because these are people's lives are involved and so forth and so on. And a lot of people believe what he said 12 months ago, but it's his word that he'll have to deal with. Anyway, the rapture or the natsal, the rapture is also connected with it. Now, there is a rapture in Scripture. There is a rapture in the Bible. What we've been saying is not as it has been popularized. You understand, in a host of movies and, and Christian kind of documentaries and other speculation, it's not like that. Just like the white Jesus is not the Jesus, you know what I mean? Then the interpretation of the rapture is not the real rapture. They may have some points correctly. They may have some of their strong concordance, look up, study words right. You understand? Know but their mind state, they are still conformed to the world because they don't want to recognize that the end of the world is the end of white supremacy of the Gentile world dominion, that if they happen to be white too, they are part of that. You understand? And the reason why is that they don't want to hold to truth over their own kind, over their own racial kind. And this is not to say that we think Obama is any kind of a messianic figure. But he might be a messianic figure. And based on what his flip-flop, he might be an anti-messianic figure. So he's a messianic figure, but not in the way that you would think he is. Now, of course, this doesn't give, get me too many, um, too many uh, kudos with a lot, of, a lot of black folks who still are like in a frozen psychological state wondering what Obama is going to do and things are getting worse and worse and worse and worse for them. But be that as it may, um, what's done is done, and let us move forward. So Revelation 12 and 1 is a sign that is also connected with this. Revelation 12 and 1. We've touched on Revelation 12 and 1. That's the woman who's clothed, who's clothed with the sun. Some say that is the constellation of um, the Virgin or the constellation of Virgo. And this is also linked with the feast or the festival of trumpets. They say this is the Hebrew wedding or this is the idea of the Jewish wedding is also an idea of the rapture, also an idea of the Maranatha, also an idea of, of, of Christ coming for the church as pointed out in the book of Revelation. So all of Revelation can be based in a sense on a wedding. Remember how Christ in his parables the Messiah in the recorded parables, he speaks about it's like a father having a wedding for his son, like he's preparing this wedding, he's going about, and he's inviting different ones, my friend, my friend, would you come to the wedding, the wedding, so forth and so on. And then remember there's a person that shows up and don't have on their wedding robe, don't have on their proper, their proper attire, 
in a, in a, in a spiritual way. They don't have Christ on, but in a direct, realistical way, they go to a wedding, not dressed up for a wedding, so they're not properly attired. Either way you look at it, they are not right for what they are trying to show up for. They, they have not prepared. It's so a lack of preparation or an outright disrespect. In other words, a lot of folks will come along and try to ride this bandwagon too as soon as they get a couple more demonstrations. But whether they will prepare themselves, do the, do the preparatory work that they should within, take that personal responsibility, in other words, to grow up to him in all things, to study and show themselves approved, that will show up. That will, that, that will demonstrate later on on whether they have their proper garments on. So when we look at that example right there, we have Revelation 12 and 1, uh, the woman clothed with the sun, a link with the constellation of Virgo, a link with the feast of trumpets, a link with the, the Jewish or the Judah-ish idea of wedding or the biblical Hebraic type of wedding slash the rapture, Marantha, come O oh Lord. Now, Shalom and Shavua Hupa, September 28th, 2011, Feast of Trumpets Rapture. Feast of Trumpets Rapture. Now, what does the Shavua, Shabua, really Shabua, but the the German and Polish Jews, they'll say probably Shavua, but what does Shavua Hupa, Hupa mean? Shavua or Shavua Hupa is the bridal week. There's what's known as the bridal week. Now, why is this bridal week important? Because it's a period of seven. It's a period of the Shabba, or a period of seven that is spent by the newlyweds in the honeymoon, get the word, honeymoon, right? The honeymoon chamber. Now, what is the honeymoon chamber? Well, interpretively, the honeymoon chamber could be nothing other than, on one hand, the New Jerusalem. You understand? The New Jerusalem on Mount Zion, you understand? The New Jerusalem is that honeymoon chamber or is one possible interpretation for the Shavua Chupa or that bridal week. Now, there's a parallel that we need to, to, to make note of. And the parallel is the same Daniel 9 and 27 verse. Where in Daniel 9 and 27, it speaks of the peace covenant. That there would be a peace covenant. And this peace covenant would begin the so-called seven-year so-called end of the world or the end of the seclorum. Let's call it, instead of the end of the world, let us call it the end of the seclorum. I think people will get it better if we call it the end of the seclorum. When we say end of the world, a lot of folks get confused, but when we say, we say the end of the seclorum, like nouveau ordo seclorum, so it's the end of the seclorum, since that's the world that the Bible is pointing to, the, the Gentile world domination or white supremacy or, or the, American, the American century or something like the American empire. I don't know what they want to call it. But anyway, it's the peace covenant. There's a peace covenant that will begin the seven-year end of the world. Well, ironically, looky-see, looky-see, what do we have going on right now? What's the major news item that's been in the news for the past couple of days, strong, is the Palestinian state. And what Obama is going to say, what the UN is going to do, will this increase war? Will they have peace? Will the Palestinians have a state? Blah, 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 blah. Well, Obama basically in his administration in this 2012, this is the perfect timing for it. Actually, it's perfect, you understand, for them to bring forward a peace covenant or a peace type of deal or negotiation. I don't know whether they'll tell you overtly that it'll be something in sevens, but it seems as though this is the perfect time, and this is aligned perfectly with that. Because what Obama is saying is that, that don't go to the U.N. You know, you can't get anything from the U.N. You can't get a state from the U.N., even though the Israelis or the Jews, the European Jews, got a state from the U.N. The U.N. gave them a state 
uh, you know, a couple of years ago, you understand, back in 48. But they're saying to the Palestinians, you can't do what the Jews them do. This is what Obama basically told them. You've got to come to me. In other words, you have to come to our ministry. You've got to talk. We've got to talk. We've got to plan. We've got to talk. So this is going to tie in with Daniel 9 and 27, the peace co covenant. But remember, the peace covenant would be broken somewhere along the middle portion of that. So look, that's another important sign to look forward. We're not saying that Obama has done this or will do this, but he's the best and likely candidate for it. Now, Revelation and this dispensation in Song of Songs, though we didn't put in some of the quotes that we have here, for example, Song of Songs 8 and 6 says, Set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm, for love is as strong as death. For love is strong as death. In other words, this new Jerusalem, Revelation 21 and 11, having the glory of God and her light was like to a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Now, this may be one of the most exciting um, and important um, postings. This one here and hopefully maybe a couple of ones that we can follow up on this one with. Why do we say this? Because this September, this, this year, this, this, this eve, this is the eve of a very important time too. 2011 is, is just one of the major, major signs. So with everything that's happening in the heavens and on the earth, this is a very important time. You understand? And this might be one of the most important um, videos, one of them. There's a lot of other good ones out there where different folks are putting different things together. It's kind of unfortunate that we don't have the option to, to really bring everything together, but there's been a long time that many of these key issues have been talked about. So um, ones and ones are without, are without excuse. You understand? It seems like, uh, yeah, all right, yeah, even Belzebub and the rest of them want to take a look, you understand, at what we're saying. You, you know, do we know anything that they don't know? Perhaps, perhaps. Anyway, this September, the church. Now, when we say the church, we're not talking about out of church. Remember what Kedamawi Hala Selassie, what his imperial majesty said concerning the church. And we don't want to even paraphrase, but we want to um, invoke his majesty's own, um, own words. His, he was asked by Dr. Hoffman, and this is from one of our books, uh, Rastafari, Rastafari um, preliminary notes to the HIM, Allah Salasi, Amharic Bible, to the Book of the Seven Seals. All right, this is a prelim preliminary note, an introduction to the Book of the Seven Seals, um, His Imperial Majesty's Bible. Here we have on page 144, Dr. Hoffman, who interviewed the Lutheran. Um, the Lutheran interview is also called 1968, the Christmas Day interview of His Imperial Majesty with Dr. Oswald Hoffman. Dr. Hoffman asks our father, asks His Imperial Majesty, Your Imperial Majesty, as a member of the body of Christ, what do you expect of the church? Hmm, interesting. His Imperial Majesty, Haile Selassie I, says the church is not merely a building. Unfortunately, th this message, you could shout it at some, some so-called Christians. They don't get it. The faithful, the church is the faithful fulfillment of the Christian life. This is what the church is. The church is not your building. So when we're speaking now about the church, about the bride of Yeshua, our black Lord and Savior, and we're speaking about um, the bridegroom's arrival, you understand, which some look at as being connected with the arrival at the rapture. When we put these things together, we need to first of all understand the terms that we're using in their proper context. 
first and foremostly that the church is the bride of Christos, the bride of Christ. But the church is not merely, you understand, a building. The church is the faithful fulfillment of the Christian life and its requirements. And its requirements. So each of us, the I and I, I and I, each of us must take that personal that personal responsibility. We must take this, this, this way, this truth, and this life personally. It's a personal, it's a personal thing. Thus, his Matthew goes on to say, thus, as the name applies to the buildings, so is our heart, the church in which God dwells. After our blameless creator was sent to this world by his Father, then the hearts of all believers, mitmanan, malet, become the temple of God. The love of God cannot be fathomed by a series of questions and answers, and man's soul cannot experience deeper enrichment as a result. We believe or we admit that men at all times be bound by his love and grace. Dr. Hoffman follows up with his imperial majesty and says, Your imperial majesty, as a member of the body of Christ, what do you feel you can contribute to the church? His imperial majesty's response, All men are endowed with natural responsibility. This responsibility is in turn distributed and delegated to all according to his gift. And it is expected of each one to fulfill his responsibility. This responsibility in turn is to God. And thus, for example, and would start his work, thus, for example, man would start his work asking God to bless the beginning and thank God for a good ending, too. We believe that all people in all their responsibilities delegated to them will begin and finish their work in God's name. I gave you brief answer. If we go into detail, we would have to spend a long time discussing and it's interesting that Dr. Hoffman would follow up and says, it is a magnificent answer, and I am deeply grateful for it. To turn to another subject, Your Imperial Majesty, are there any passages of the Bible that have become especially meaningful to you? His Majesty's response, I have the highest respect for the Bible as a whole. We also recognize the rightful name the Bible bears. We find that in all the periods of the Old Testament and the times of the patriarch kings and prophets, great miracles were done. On the other hand, the time in which our Lord himself gave the command to go to all the world and to preach is also of high value. Then Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John, the four Gospels in which the sayings of our Lord are recorded, are pillars for all men on the earth. Therefore, the Bible should not be cut into portions. One, one more, please, just stay tuned. Just, just, just stay right there. Dr. Hoffman now says, as a mature Christian, which means that even Dr. Hoffman and true Christians recognize there is, there is a, a baby Christian, like, like a, a newborn babe, and then there, there are the sons and the daughters and the more mature Christians. So there is a maturity in Christianity. But a lot of this has been lost in this counterfeit Christianity and, and this kind of stuff that, that a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of people, they, they like this, but they're, they're ignorant. It's like a, kid, a child would like to eat sugar and, and candy even before bed. But this eventually will get that child sick and might even kill that child. But Dr. Hoffman asks, as a mature Christian, have you a special word for young people of these days? And this is our special word for the brothers and sisters and some of the young people who may be tuning in to this broadcast. His imperial Matthew Halasalasi says, 
On this occasion, I address all those within our empire. Our Christianity is not restricted to a given church, and I stress above all that we do not wish to make distinctions. My advice to all is to fulfill the Ten Commandments. You are aware of the co contents of the Ten Commandments and can elaborate on it. If the nation for which I am the emperor or Nebuchadnezzar, king of kings, follows and accepts this, since it is also what I accept and follow, I would believe our country is not only historically Christian, but also actively Christian. Now, that is, that, there's, there's much more to this interview. Get a copy of this, but you can even find the interview online if you look it up. His Imperial Majesty's uh, interview with his, his Imperial Majesty, so forth and so on. Um, our, our main point in, in touching on that is because it also touches on what's going on in this present time. The match was struck in Ethiopia again. This time the spiritual warfare match was struck in Ethiopia. But the flames are burning the world. When we look in the West, too, there's a debate on about, about, about religion in the classroom. In America, they were successful <coughs> to some great extent to remove God from the classroom. Currently, we see a rise in immorality. But this immorality, they are trying to, to sell us on this immorality, and they're trying to call this immorality the so-called new normal, the new normal, that this is the new normal. They're trying to say that this is the way that we all are going to be living, so um, get with it. But... Jah is not mocked, O world, and those who believe in the world. You are mocked. You know what I'm saying? You are the one who's mocked, not, not Jah. God is not mocked, but the world is mocked. And if what we've been um, meditating on, reading, and most of all spiritually feeling is true, we are going to head through a very interesting time. You know what I'm saying? What we're going to see. You understand? And, and feel it in, in, in real ways, the mockery of the world, but no mockery of Jah, where ones are going to recognize that they probably should have kept the Bible in the classroom. They probably shouldn't have allowed this abortion thing, you know, to, to, to become um, abortion. Like the Rastafari song, remember that song? How many of you remember that one? I forgot who did it. Um, somebody, if you know the name, who, who done this, and I could look it up on the internet, but anyway, some of y'all know who I into the music. What's that, Rastafari's on the reggae song? Um, abortion, killing a murder. Whoa. Oh, Lord. Abortion killing is, a mur is murder. I know there's those, those unique cases. What if a woman was raped? Should she still have to be as a child or something like that? What if she has a medical condition? You know, you, you know they, they are going to the exceptions. Well, exceptions are just that, exceptions. But we live in a time where everybody thinks that every, everything concerning them, we live in a very self-righteous, a self-righteous, deluded age. The world, however, this September may really see, and I think it's already should have seen some of the handwriting on the wall, but it's going to see more, though it might not understand the language it's written in, more of the handwriting on the wall. In other words, Babylon's death warrant has been issued. We're here to announce that Babylon's death warrant has been issued. You, you remember in the, in the interview with His Majesty where we just read a portion of it, um, His Majesty said, I do not wish to make distinctions. Do you know why he said that, why he didn't wish to make distinctions? Not because he believed that everybody is equally doing the right thing. But in his position, for him to make distinctions at that time would bring things into judgment. You understand? Would, would bring it into judgment at that time. Thankfully, he knew that we, and many of us, were, were so young then. You understand? We would have had maybe very little opportunity if we were to rely on a deep end, you know, on our parents and the other generation to maybe find what we have found. 
the half of the story that's not never been told before in the light of Aras de Fari. But this September, the handwriting is on the wall. The earth has received this planet, the Babylonian system, the rulers, the fallen being. They have received their death warrant. Really, I think it's an arrest warrant first. The first is the arrest warrant. You understand? And then the trial. You understand? People say they've already been put on trial. No. The day of judgment is a day of judging these things. It's a day of bringing these things. But first you have to bring the convicted. You understand? First you have to put them under arrest. You have to bind them up. You understand? So what will bind up this new world order? Because there's been people who have been preaching and proclaiming this word in various different ways. And ones have been turning deaf to it because there is so much distraction. There is so much distraction that exists out there, you understand, that has been allowing people to say, oh, I'm not into that religious, that God stuff, because they, they always ask for money or something. You know, they, they find any little thing to distract them because of the multimedia. You, you see this multimedia and, and, and this technology. And people are telling you clearly, I cannot live without my cell phone. I cannot live without my such and such. It's not because... Well, well, still, they're saying they can't live without it, so, so it's because of idolatry. I mean, there are some good things that you can, you know, you could call, communicate with family, loved ones, and such and such, and send them information back, and that's all great. But some people are so wrapped up into this and caught up on this so-called, this, this new normal, you know, saying that the only thing that will get their attention is for something to come and to wipe that out the way. To, to, to cripple, cramp, and to paralyze that. When, when, when those devices of Babylon have been killed, crampled, and paralyzed, maybe then some would, would, would wake up and hear. So the arrest leading to the death warrant, they've already been sentenced to death, you know, but right now the, the arrest warrant is being issued, and, and we're at this beginning of what's known as the Yom Hadin, you understand, or the Yom Ha Adon, you understand, the day of the Lord, or the day of judgment commencing. So stay tuned, a little bit more to come, um, y'all willing, stay tuned to the next part of this, all right? Shalom, Rastafari.